Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being with us today, being here with us today, sorry. My name is Ching Li, and I'm the Program Director of the Postgraduate Diploma in Diabetes Management and Education Program at the International Medical University, Malaysia. Now, just some housekeeping rules. To ensure you get the best experience at this webinar, we have muted all microphones of the attendees. So, how do you talk to us? If you have any questions or feedback during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A panel and we will answer it at the end of the session during a Q&A session. We will have three 15-minute micro sessions today. Now, if we have any doctors, pharmacists, dietitians or nutritionists participating today, today's webinar is equivalent to one CPD point. So you can collect your CPD point at the end of this webinar. I would also like to inform everyone that this live webinar session will be recorded. Now, over the next one hour, what can you look forward to? You will get insights from globally recognized key opinion leaders on how we, as healthcare providers, can address three of the top challenges to optimizing glucose control. That is one, balancing current diabetes therapies, two, educating patients on self-management, and three, improving patient adherence to intervention. The speakers who will be sharing their insights today are Professor Dr. Dr. Bafauzi Muhammad, an endocrinologist, Ms. Michelle Robbins, a credentialed diabetes educator, and Dr. Navin Kumar Loganadan, a clinical pharmacist with a specialty in diabetes care. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Professor Dr. Dr. Mafauzi Muhammad. Professor Mafauzi is a professor of medicine and a senior consultant endocrinologist from the University of Science Malaysia. He also teaches into the IMU Postgraduate Diploma in Diabetes Management and Education Program. Prof. Mafauzi is a well-known and respected leader in the fields of endocrinology and diabetes care, both locally and internationally. He is also an established researcher with more than 100 research grants in the field of diabetes, dyslipidemia, and thyroid disorders. Prof. Mafauzi will be speaking on the topic, Optimizing Glucose Control with Medical Management, What Works and What Does Not. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much, Shing Li, for that uh, very kind introduction. And I would like to thank uh, IMU for organizing this webinar. Uh, my uh, topic is on the uh, optimizing glucose control with medical management, uh, what works and what does not. Okay. So, um, I think to start off first, I think one of the challenges and difficulties that we face in treating uh, people with diabetes, especially type 2 diabetes, is that type 2 diabetes is a progressive disease. What it means that over time, there will be an increase in the blood sugar, both uh, the uh, fasting and the postprandial uh, blood sugar. And this is really mainly related to the fact that over time, there is a decrease in the beta cell function. Okay? And, the, and in fact, at diagnosis, it is estimated that about 50% uh, of the beta fun cell functions are lost. Uh, and you know, diabetes actually starts very much uh, early on. Uh, the fact that one of the driving factors for type 2 diabetes is insulin resistance. And insulin resistance, uh, of which the main cause is obesity, yeah. in the early phase, uh, the body, uh, our body is able to overcome uh, the insulin resistance by producing more insulin. Yeah. Prof. Mafauzi, yes. sorry, Prof. Mafauzi, sorry? Um, can you please share um, your slides? I think your slides have not been shared. Oh, right. Yes. Uh, let me check. Right. 
Can, uh, can you see my slide now? Let me just wait. No, I don't see the slides yet. All right. Okay. Yes, I see, I see the All slides right. now. Okay. Yes, beautiful. Thank All you right. so much. All right. So we'll start. Okay. So whatever you are start. All right. Okay. Sorry for that. All right. But uh, as I was mentioning, um, that um, the problem with type 2 diabetes, the main challenge is that over time, there, were, uh, there is a big increase in the uh, blood, uh, blood sugar. And this relates to the fact that there is a decline in the beta cell function. Yeah? And in fact, uh, at the point of diagnosis, nearly 50% uh, of our uh, beta cells are already lost. And type 2 diabetes actually starts very much early on. This is because uh, the fact that uh, the main driving factor for type 2 diabetes is actually insulin resistance. And the main cause of insulin resistance is uh, obesity. Yeah? And as people uh, gain weight, mainly due to lifestyle factors, then uh, insulin resistance goes up. And at the same time, the body will try to compensate for the insulin resistance by producing more insulin. Yeah? Uh, at certain point in time, uh, the blood sugar starts to go up. Uh, first to go up is the postprandial blood sugar and later the fasting blood sugar. Yeah? And as the beta cells declines further, and the, hence there is a further rise in both the fasting and the postprandial blood glucose. And the increase in the blood glucose will uh, cause, its main, main driving cause for the macrovascular complications. And macrovascular complications starts very early on, even before the onset of diabetes. And this relates to the fact that macrovascular complication is not only contributed to by blood sugar, but also other factors such as dyslipidemia and hypertension. And this will normally result in the way that people treat, that we treat diabetes. That initially at the point of diagnosis, uh, we are able to manage the blood sugar just by lifestyle and the oral anti-diabetic agent. And with further decline in beta cell function, that we really need now to go on to insulin. Initially, most of us will either start with a once daily insulin, either a basal insulin or a premix insulin uh, on top of the oral anti-diabetic agent, which is initiating the insulin uh, treatment. Yeah? And with further decline in beta cell, then uh, the insulin will need to be uh, up uh, in optimized and up titrated to reach or maintain glycemic targets. And again, over time, when the beta cells uh, fail further, then obviously there is a need now to intensify insulin treatment, either with the use of basal plus bolus insulin, called basal plus and basal bolus therapy, or with multiple premix insulin. Okay? And then uh, obviously, over time, this is probably the, the, the end treatment as far as diabetes is concerned, we we'll call the uh, replacement, uh, the beta cell or the insulin replacement therapy of either basal, basal or basal uh, bolus regimen. Okay. So that's how the, uh, in terms of the algorithm of treatment with, uh, for type 2 diabetes. Okay. Now, as uh, I'm sure you're aware that there are many types of oral anti-diabetic uh, agents. Okay. Uh, and also, uh, we talk about injectable therapy as well, okay, the GLP-1 receptor agonist and the insulin therapy. So what in essence that we do is that uh, each of these classes of the glucose-lowering drugs, okay, be it uh, oral uh, or the injectables, uh, metformin, uh, salpinuria, uh, glenides, uh, the alpha-glucose disc inhibitors, the thousylindiones, uh, TZDs, the uh, DPP-4 inhibitors, uh, GLT-2 inhibitors, uh, the GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, insulin, have their own pros and cons. Okay? So what we tend to do is we tend to list what are the pros of these uh, agents and what are the cons of these agents. So that uh, when we um, decide on what therapy, it is actually based on uh, what is best for them in terms of the advantages and the advantages of the various uh, agents. For metformin, for instance, the advantages is that it is uh, quite uh, potent in A1C reduction. It works mainly at the 
uh, fasting sugar level. It doesn't cause hypoglycemia. It can cause a reduction in weight, but uh, it has a GI side effects. Uh, it's fairly neutral as far as the congestive heart failure is concerned. It actually may reduce cardiovascular death. Uh, has no effect on the uh, bone or, or osteoporosis. And in people with diabetic kidney disease, DKD, uh, it is best to avoid, especially in uh, stage four and five DKD. Okay? For uh, salpingitis, uh, it works at both the fasting and prospendial. It has a, a uh, impact as far as hypo, can cause hypoglycemia. Uh, it can cause weight gain. It doesn't have much effect on the GI side effects. Uh, neutral as far as the heart failure and, and cardiovascular uh, disease. Uh, have no impact on bone, uh, bone loss. And in people with diabetic kidney disease, there is a risk of hypoglycemia. For the glenites, it's almost similar to SU, except that perhaps it is uh, less um, uh, in terms of causing hypoglycemia uh, and uh, weight change. Yeah? But uh, in general, it's just about the same uh, side effects or adverse effect uh, as for uh, SU. For the alpha glucosidase, glucosidase inhibitors, uh, which mainly inhibits the absorption of glucose uh, from the gut, okay? the, it's fairly neutral as far as hypoglycemia is concerned, fairly neutral as far as weight is concerned, and it can cause uh, GI symptoms such as uh, bloatedness, flatulence, and diarrhea, and fairly neutral as far as the other adverse events are concerned, such as heart failure, uh, cardiovascular disease, bone loss, and uh, also in diabetic kidney disease, it can be used, it's fairly safe in these people. Okay? For the thiazolidinediones, that is TZDs, yeah? uh, then it's fairly neutral, doesn't cause uh, hypoglycemia as much, it can increase weight, uh, weight. Okay, that's one of the disadvantages of uh, the TZDs. Uh, fairly neutral as far as the GI symptoms are concerned. Uh, it can cause increase in heart failure because it causes water retention, so be careful about that. Uh, it's fairly neutral as far as cardiovascular disease is concerned. Uh, I saw uh, it may actually increase the risk of osteoporosis. And in people with uh, diabetic kidney disease, then obviously uh, fluid retention is a concern. Okay? For the peptida, peptidase inhibitors, the DPT4 inhibitors, okay? it's uh, fairly neutral as far as hypoglycemia and weight is concerned. Uh, quite like the uh, AG, uh, glucose inhibitors and metformin, it may actually cause a bit of GI side effects. Uh, fairly neutral as far as heart failure, cardiovascular disease, bone loss is concerned. In, in diabetic kidney disease, yes, you can use TPP4, but uh, those adjustments is required uh, in this uh, sort of patients. Uh, for SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, it's the, one of the advantages of this uh, agent uh, over the other agent, which is that it can cause weight uh, loss. So this is one of the anti-diabetic agent that has been shown to uh, cause a redu uh, weight reduction. It has also been shown to reduce uh, heart failure and to reduce cardiovascular events and also tends to reduce uh, diabetic, uh, progression of diabetic kidney disease and uh, end stage renal failure. So this is one of the advantages of the uh, gluc sodium glucose uh, transport uh, inhibitors. Yeah. For the GLP-1 receptor agonist, which is uh, mainly an injectable, yeah. uh, again, one of the main uh, advantage of this uh, medication is in terms of weight. It can cause um, quite marked weight uh, loss. Yeah? Uh, very useful for people with uh, obesity and type 2 diabetes. Uh, for, uh, it has some GI side effects, okay, mostly GI side effects, quite similar to the uh, metformin and AGI. Yeah? And also has been shown to also has advantage of reducing uh, cardiovascular disease. And at the same time, has been also shown to reduce to reduce the progression of, uh, diabet of diabetic nephropathy. Okay? And for insulin, uh, we know that um, it is probably the most potent uh, anti-diabetic uh, agent, but unfortunately it comes with the price of uh, hypoglycemia and also weight gain. Okay? Uh, at the same time, uh, apart from that, it seems to be quite neutral as far as the other symptoms are concerned. And of course, in people with uh, diabetic kidney disease, again, 
the main concern of insulin is actually hypoglycemia. So when we were to choose any of these agents, we have to weigh the patient's profile and looking for the benefits and also the disadvantages of these agents for these patients. So in terms of um, what is best for each patient, it really depends on the patient's profile. Okay? This is taken from the uh, American Diabetes Association, the European Association for Study Di Diabetes, in terms of which agent is best for each particular patient. Again, and I think the main message here is that it depends on the patient. Okay? So the first uh, thing that they suggest is that when a patient, that when a patient with diabetes comes to the, uh, the doctor, uh, and uh, we are sort of thinking of what sort of treatment is best for this patient, first of all is to ask ourselves whether the patient has high risk or established uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, uh, chronic kidney disease, or heart failure. Okay? If the patient has uh, this, any of these three uh, factors, then they suggest that in a patient, that you consider that if patient has atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease that predominates, then uh, they have high risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease based on this fact that they're more than 55 years and they have uh, coronary or carotid or lower extremity atherosclerosis. Okay? It's per, uh, the, uh, for this type of patient, it's preferable, preferable to use GLP-1 receptor agonist okay? or uh, GLP-2. Okay? So uh, for this type of patient, this is the agent that probably works best uh, in terms of reducing the risk. Okay? For patients who have heart failure of CKD, this suggests that uh, to use um, the SGLT2 inhibitors because SGLT2 inhibitors, as I mentioned, has been shown to reduce heart failure and reduce uh, the progression to uh, end-stage renal disease. And so on from that, if the A1C is still above target, then to use the other agents uh, in terms of this order, okay? Uh, either uh, DPP-4, basal insulin, TZD, SU. DPP-4, of course, is, cannot be used uh, if a uh, patient is on a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Yeah? Uh, and similarly, for this patient, if uh, they do not respond, A1C is above target, then to use any of these agents. Yeah? The next question is to establish if they do not have uh, cardiovascular disease, CKD or heart failure, then they look at the uh, other factors. Is there a compelling need to min minimize hypoglycemia, i.e patients who are elderly where hypoglycemia is a, a big risk, then they suggest that to use either this, uh, DPP-4 inhibitors, uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist, SGLT-2 inhibitors, or TZD. Because these agents, as I've shown earlier, do not cause hypoglycemia on its own. Okay? And from there on, add on all these other agents if the A1C is still above target. If the uh, Problem with the patient is actually weight gain or, uh, or to, uh, i.e. there is a need to re reduce weight. Then they suggest to use either a GLP-1 receptor agonist or a GLP-2 inhibitors. Again, this because these agents as I've uh, shown earlier, these are the only two agents that can cause weight loss. Okay? And from then on, if the A1C is above target, to use the other uh, agents. And if cost is a major issue, because most of these agents are fairly expensive, yeah? then to use uh, SU or TZD. Remember, I forgot to say that the first line therapy is still metformin okay? and lifestyle management. Okay? So all the other, other agents are on top of the metformin. Yeah? If cost is a major issue, then we recommend the use of SUs or uh, TZDs because they are fairly cheap. Okay? And again, to work on this line, and finally, it's either the use of insulin if any of these agents were to fail. Now, coming back to the injectable therapies, okay, as I mentioned, for injectable therapy, it's either a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an insulin. The recommendation is that for people who fail uh, or anti-diabetic agent and needs to move on to an injectable, then they suggest that for most patients, consider GLP-1 receptor agonist. Okay? As it's shown because GLP-1 receptor agonist has been shown to be even more potent uh, than insulin uh, for most patients in the initial stage. Okay? 
more efficacious rather. Insulin is more potent, but efficacy is one on the other aspect. Uh, and of course, if the A1C is still above target, if the patient is on GLP-1 subtagonist and to uh, add on uh, insulin, either basal insulin or go on to either basal plus analog or even the use of uh, premixed insulin. Yeah. And again, if the patient is on uh, GLP-1 uh, agent, as I mentioned, then to add on insulin, but there is a subset of patients where the, uh, if the A1C is quite high and the patient uh, is in the so-called insulin deficient state, i.e. they are fairly thin and they have quite symptomatic uh, hyperglycemia, then perhaps the first agent will probably be uh, insulin for these patients. Okay. So, and work on from uh, that guideline onwards. Okay. So, in summary, then, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, just to share that uh, diabetes mellitus is a progressive disease, and this is mainly due to a decline in beta cell function over time. Yeah? And therapy needs to be intensified over time to maintain glycemic control, yeah? simply because uh, as uh, the level of insulin falls, then blood glucose will go higher. Uh, then, of course, we need to add on uh, medications or even uh, move on to injectable to maintain glucose control. Yeah? Each antihyperglycemic agents, as I've said, have their own pros and cons. So we have to choose the antihyperglycemic agents depending very much on individual patient characteristics. As I mentioned, whether the patient had coronary artery disease, whether the patient had heart failure, whether the patient has high risk of um, hypoglycemia, and so on. Okay? However, uh, as I mentioned, many of the agents of choice uh, in the, uh, for optimal treatment is fairly costly. Uh, so, in real world, okay, the choice of antihyperglycemic agents depends very much on availability and affordability, i.e. patients may not get the optimal uh, antihyperglycemic therapy at the beginning simply because uh, of the uh, fact that it may not be available or if it's available, it may not be affordable for the patient. So, we have to balance uh, all these uh, uh, so-called factors to ensure that our patients get the best treatment, perhaps at the cost that they or the cost of the health payer in, in the sense that our side will be the government uh, can afford you know, for their treatment. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Hey, thank you very much, Professor Mufauzi. Now to all attendees, I hope you're enjoying the session so far. Now remember, if you have any questions or feedback during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A panel and we will answer your questions during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Now, it is my honour to introduce the second speaker, Ms. Michelle Robbins, who joins us today from Australia. Ms. Michelle Robbins is an endorsed nurse practitioner diabetes at Northern Health and is a member of the Deakin University Conjoint Academic Staff. She also teaches into the IMU Postgraduate Diploma in Diabetes Management and Education Program. Ms. Robbins has been working as a credentialed diabetes educator for 25 years in services that have spanned both community and tertiary healthcare. She also actively communicates her work in conferences and publications. In the year 2010, Ms. Robbins received the Jan Baldwin Award to recognize and reward excellence in a holistic approach to diabetes education and care. Ms. Robbins will be speaking on the topic, optimizing glucose control with education. What works and what does not? Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you uh, for our previous speaker. I'd like to just remind everyone that uh, we're now to the point of um, having diabetes, uh, having insulin uh, now for nearly a hundred years. And um, one of the things that the development of insulin meant was that it actually then became the development of diabetes education. And although a century later, we would not necessarily agree with all of these statements from Jocelyn, 
uh, it did actually start that concept of, of the importance of education and the importance of managing diabetes. And when I mean managing diabetes, I'm talking about self-management. Because when you have diabetes, even if you attend your uh, doctor's appointments, your diabetes educator, dietitian, podiatry, optometry, dental, etc., that still leaves over 8,754 hours for you to actually manage diabetes by yourself. Um, as profits shown from the EASD ADA type two management guidelines that came out two years ago, the other component of the um, management of, of di type two diabetes, and again, this is relevant in type one diabetes, was yes, the medication management, but also the uh, glycemic management in terms of education and having uh, conversations and dialogues and working in with partnerships. And I want you just to focus in on the green circle, is that our goals of care are not just a HBA 1 7%. In fact, the ADA and the EASD has actually said that the goals of care should be about preventing complications, short-term and long-term, and optimizing quality of health. And as you can see on this very busy slide, there are a number of components required to actually try and achieve those two things. If we look at the key areas, you can see that it's actually a pathway where we need to travel with our patients. And again, as I said, this is a type two pathway, but it still works with type one diabetes and move from one component to the next. We can't uh, swap around, we can't bypass, we actually have to move on this journey with our patients because diabetes is complex. Uh, as Prof said, type two is progressive and we need to be aware that to address these challenges, we, we need to look at a wider range of, of issues. One of the most important things is that for the person to take on board some of the things that we're recommending, the education that we would like to provide for them, they first have to be convinced they have diabetes, that having diabetes uh, and its consequences is serious, that the treatments that might be being recommended to them are beneficial, even if those uh, treatments require um, a financial outlay, a lot of input, time and energy to actually achieve that. Now, in practice over 27 years, there are two key questions I ask with every patient I see, whether they have type one or type two diabetes. First, were they surprised that they were diagnosed with diabetes? And my goodness, that opens up a real Pandora's box where people were so surprised they were completely shocked and overwhelmed to the other extent where people were actually not surprised in any way. And that gives you an idea of where their mindset is with you today. We always often ask about patient um, uh, family history of diabetes, but we often don't ask the sub question of that, and that's the experience of, of diabetes within the family. So with that family ex, uh, experience, has it been a positive or a negative experience? Has a family member had an amputation or gone on dialysis, for example, or have they made a number of changes and they remain well and they remain a, a, a very happy person with a high quality of life? One of the things that my colleagues often make a, an error of is when the patient is sitting in front of them, they assume that the per person in front of them should change, they want to change their life and their health, that their health is their pro prime motivator for everything in their life, uh, that now is the right time to make all these changes, that a tough approach is a really good approach, like maybe threatening someone, that they'll go blind if they don't take on what we uh, say and suggest, that if they've tried something in the past, then they've failed, um, you know, it hasn't been us, and that we are the expert and that the person must listen to us and, if you like, obey and that there is that power shift. Instead, what we should be looking at 
are principles of patient-centred care. And the Australian Diabetes Educators Association have 10 principles of patient-centred care. And I just want to focus on a couple of these. For example, in terms of being respectful for a person's culture and health beliefs, in my own practice, that would be an example of that would be supporting my patients that wish to fast during Ramadan, for example. As a prescriber of diabetes medicines, I also need to look at number six in terms of the person's experience of medicines, uh, what their needs and preferences might be with medicines in terms of oral agents, uh, injectable agents, weekly uh, injectable agents or uh, multiple daily injectable agents. Also, I need to um, not only be communicating with, with my patients, but also communicating with uh, family members, caregivers, and then a much wider uh, conversation as well. So it might be with external agencies, it might be uh, with aged care facilities, mental health care workers, uh, home visiting nurses, and then actually an even wider communication. So when we talk about patient-centred care, we actually need to involve people with diabetes in the way we develop our services, for example, and some of the education materials that we provide for people with diabetes. So that consumer engagement is vital if we're really going to do patient-centred care in a very good way. Again and again, we talk about the journey that the person is on. And this is a journey that we'll often travel with people as well, particularly people with type one diabetes, where we will be um, having ongoing engagement with them for the rest of their lives. Again, it's important to know where someone is on that journey. Are they so shocked and overwhelmed and, and grieved by having diabetes that they really take on board some of the things that we would be suggesting or are they coming to us today with a degree of acceptance ready to make change and it's important to know where that person sits with us today in fact then that means that we also then need to know at what point people are ready to start to change so it may be in that first consultation people are only looking at for inf information rather than wanting to um, actually take on board and make changes, or they might be working their way through of wanting to have change, wanting to be able to set goals, and then actually uh, putting that into place. There is nothing in our own lives that we, uh, that we do proficiently at the start, that everything in our lives that we do takes a series of steps that we start at the beginning and that we move slowly with steps uh, until we are more proficient. And that is certainly the case for people with diabetes, being able to self-manage their diabetes. So as a prescriber, it doesn't matter what I prescribe. If the person I'm prescribing to is not um, uh, proficient in self-managing their diabetes, my medication will not be working as effectively and as efficiently as I would like it to be. Goal setting is key. And without good goal setting, we're not going to achieve what we're wanting to achieve. And many of you would be aware of SMART goals, but uh, more recently, we're now talking about smarter goals. So yes, we want goals that are specific and measurable, they're action oriented, they're realistic, they have timelines on them. But if 2020 has taught us nothing, then we should also expect that goals that we set may come uh, across problems and that we need to review those, those goals and maybe refine them in a better way. Uh, also, we need to look at how important some goals are that are set. We might think certain goals are very important and very urgent, and the person with diabetes may have a different idea of what that might be. And again, around time restraints and resources may also affect how those goals um, are reached. An example of competence is insulin uh, education. I could talk about how to give uh, an injection of insulin um, and that's one way of educating. 
but I could demonstrate how to give uh, insulin and that would be at a higher level of education. But the highest level and actually being able to review competence would be for me to observe someone with diabetes actually assembling an insulin pen and then self-administering. And that really is the highest level of competence. The most important thing is Please don't tell people what to do, tell them why. So again, insulin is a good example. Don't tell them um, you, you, uh, the what's, but why we put insulin in the fridge, why we give certain insulins at the timing with a particular meal, why we resuspend cloudy insulin, why we wait 10 seconds after uh, administering insulin before we remove the pen. Because if we tell people why, then they're more likely to do it rather than the what's. When we look at um, uh, trying to get success with diabetes education and self-management, we also have to look at ourselves, the way our service works and the way we support people. So that if we don't have ongoing education for people, we're unlikely to get the same sort of success because a one-off education program is not going to be successful as ongoing education. So how we educate is going to be very important as well. So again, to summarise, what we do requires different steps. It requires a pathway. It requires a partnership that we are at with equal partnership with our patients with diabetes in order that management is also self-management of diabetes. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you very much. So smarter goals, that's what I've learned today. That's something new for me. Now to all attendees, remember if you have any questions or feedback during the presentation, please type them into the question and answer panel. We already have a few questions there and we will answer your questions during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Now it is my delight to introduce the third and final speaker, Dr. Navin Kumar Loganadan. Dr. Navin Kumar Loganadan is a clinical pharmacist diabetes at the Diabetes Medication Therapy Adherence Clinic or DMTAC in Putrajaya Hospital. Dr. Navin has 13 years of experience working as a diabetes care clinical pharmacist managing medication related problems of type 2 diabetes patients. His research in the field of diabetes has been presented at local and international conferences. Dr. Navin has also received several awards most notably the Next Generation Scientist Award 2016 by University of Basel, Switzerland. Dr. Navin today will be speaking on the topic Optimizing Glucose Control with Treatment Adherence, What Works and What Does Not. Thank you, Dr. Ching Li, for the kind introduction. So um, today uh, we'll, we are talking about diabetes management and uh, I work as a DM Tech Pharmacist in Putrajaya Hospital. So I'll be sharing with you uh, my experience on adherence, yeah, medication adherence of type 2 diabetes patients. So uh, what works and what does not work uh, in optimizing treatment adherence. Yeah? So before we move on further um, on the adherence topic, we need to understand, or probably I would like to quickly give you a snapshot about the state of diabetes in our country. So this is the recently uh, uh, released data on diabetes, yeah, the National Health and Mobility Survey 2019 have shown that the prevalence of diabetes in adults uh, aged more than 18 years old continues to climb, okay? from 11.2 in 2011, moved steadily up to 13.4%, and now it's 18.3%. We have one in five Malaysians having diabetes in Malaysia. So that is actually an increasing diabetes burden. So just now you have listened to Prof. Mafalzi, he showed to you all the treatments that are available to treat diabetes, okay? So, but how well are we doing? Uh, so this is one study by uh, uh, Prof. Mafalzi himself, I think, the Diet Care 2008 and uh, 2013 studies that have shown the control of diabetes patients, uh, hospitalized, uh, hospital uh, uh, diabetes patients, yeah? So you can see uh, only about 22 
percent of them achieved an A1C of the target A1C. And the recent uh, uh, data uh, shows that uh, you know on the uh, primary care diabetes patients, yeah, the National Diabetes Registry data shows that uh, you know only 23.3 percent of patients uh, achieve A1C of less than 6.5 percent. So there is suboptimal glycemic control. What about complications? Yeah, so I understand that okay, we also have one of the largest number of uh, kidney failure patients in the world, uh, one of the largest number of dialysis patients in the world. So um, you can see that the rate of diabetes complications are climbing uh, steadily also because of the suboptimal glycemic control. When we come to our own uh, diabetes uh, treatment, yeah, treatment complications, okay, uh, for all those anti-diabetic medications and insulin that we have. Okay, we can see that uh, the HAT study has shown that patients uh, on, 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 on insulin and oral therapy, about 33.4% uh, of them had hypoglycemia. Yeah? So about one third of treated patients have hypoglycemia and that's about 4,279 Malaysian ringgit for the treatment of uh, hypoglycemia in the hospital. So you have increasing diabetes burden, you have suboptimal glycemic control, you have increasing rate of diabetes complication, and you also have increasing rate of treatment complications. Yeah? So we come to medication adherence. Uh, it's an interesting topic, but uh, uh, something important when, when patients are not reaching the target, often we uh, always talk about diet, we talk about lifestyle, but medication adherence is also an important factor. Um, Medication adherence is the extent to which the patient's uh, medication uh, uh, behavior corresponds to the prescribed medication dosing regime. Yeah? So are they taking the medication according to the time, the dose and the interval that we have prescribed to them? That's important. Now, medication non-adherence is associated with poor therapeutic outcomes. Yeah, I'll show you in the next slide. But, um, you know, it's actually something that's very important. You know, Prof. Mavazi have shown that you have a lot of uh, good drugs available. We have SGLT2 inhibitors, we have GLP-1, we have uh, the newer insulins, we have all, almost all the anti-diabetic class uh, in our country, but yet we are not uh, achieving the target. And, uh, you know, uh, besides uh, diet and lifestyle, uh, adherence is also one of the important factors that causes that, yeah? So, um, Often people ask me, you know, is there an association between uh, medication adherence and glucose control? Yes, in this slide, you can see the uh, paper by Rosenfield uh, and Hunt in 2008. They have shown that if the medication adherence moves towards the right, moves towards almost 100%, you can see that the adjusted A1C comes down. So this is an evidence that if you improve medication adherence, then you can improve patient's glycemic control. Now, what are the reasons? What are the common reasons for non-adherence among our patients? Yeah? They can be classified into about uh, three um, factors, uh, I mean, uh, three uh, categories. Uh, one of it is provider or system related. The other one is patient related and also medication related. For provider or system related, okay, uh, it is usually due to confusion, patient's confusion of the instructions, medication taking instructions probably is not conveyed in a manner that they better understand, uh, you know, Probably there's language barrier, uh, patient lacks the understanding of how to take those medication, poor communication, sometimes it's inevitable. Maybe uh, the healthcare professional has a very limited time, uh, lots of patients, so probably in that short period of time, they cannot communicate the medication instructions um, you know, uh, very correctly to the patient. Uh, and, and also in Malaysia, it is very common due to uh, very easy access to healthcare. We only pay about one Malaysian ringgit to go to the government facilities. Our patients also go to multiple uh, clinics, for example. They can, they can have the diabetic clinic appointment sometimes. They can have the cardio or nephro clinic appointment. And sometimes they can be given the same medications, yeah? Because uh, we, we do not have an integrated medical record. So uh, it's manual prescription sometimes, you know. Um, they can be polypharmacy, they can be redundant, uh, re redundancy in medications that are being prescribed to the patients. Patient-related factors, okay, very important driver of non-adherence. Uh, patients may have certain cultural beliefs, okay, they may not uh, trust modern medicine. Some of the patients, yeah, they may not trust hospital medicine. They're uh, comfortable with uh, complementary medicines. 
um, some of them have certain uh, dietary practices. Yeah, they they may uh, believe more on uh, you know. Uh, something like boiling certain kind of roots or uh, leaves and take that for diabetes. They think that will cure their diabetes, uh, you know, or treat their diabetes better than the medications. And uh, misconceptions about medications. These are myths. We, we find that in our clinic, a lot of patients have myths about medications. Yeah? For example, the common ones are like, you know, insulin can cause blindness. Insulin can cause kidney failure. Um, insulin can cause death. You know, you know, but but little they understand that these uh, information are given by non-professionals. And non-professionals, uh, you know, they probably associate, uh, you know, someone who actually had poorly controlled diabetes and had kidney failure, and and was only started insulin about six months or one month earlier, before, uh, one year earlier before being diagnosed with that kidney failure. And then, you know, um, that is actually not because the insulin is causing kidney failure in that patient. That's because the diabetes was not controlled. So we need to address this, yeah? And, and as what uh, Ms. Uh, Robbins have mentioned, you know, a lot of patients are also in denial state. Okay, they have not accepted that they have diabetes, they have forgetfulness, they have no family support or social support. You know? Medication related factors, uh, multiple medications not mentioned before. Our patients okay, uh, don't only have diabetes, a lot of them also have coexisting hypertension and hyperlipidemia. So that brings the number of uh, you know, pills or medications to about, about eight to 10 types of medications. So you know, can we make the regimen a little bit more complex for them? Fear of side effects, you know, frequent changes in drug regimen, yeah? At every visit, sometimes the insulin doses has been tight, uh, you know, adjusted and they don't keep abreast with those changes. So, Diabetes Medication Therapy Adherence Clinic uh, is, uh, 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 you know, an adherence clinic uh, offered by pharmacists in the Ministry of Health. It was started in 2006 in the Penang Hospital. Right. The objective is to improve type 2 diabetes patients' understanding of medications, medication adherence, glycemic control, blood pressure control, and lipid control. And currently, we have almost about 400 uh, DM tech clinics all over the Ministry of Health facilities. Yeah. So very quickly, uh, what is the difference between DM tech and the uh, common counseling? Uh, in DM tech, patients have pharmacists, uh, you know, seeing them in between the doctor visits. Yeah, the doctor visits in the yellow boxes. You can see the red boxes where they also have monthly or two monthly visit with the pharmacies where the adherence prob problems are addressed. Now, uh, the next couple of minutes, I will actually uh, share with you some best practices, some experience from our DM tech clinic on a medication adherence, what works and what does not work, yeah? So, um, for newly diagnosed patients, okay, it is very common to actually, uh, you know, um, for the health professionals to instill fear because uh, we thought that actually uh, by instilling fear, the patient will make changes, yeah? So, um, something like, you know, it is usually conveyed to them something like, okay, you have uh, no choice but to take these uh, medications, otherwise you might die of uh, kidney failure. And uh, this is uh, something, it is not the right way to actually motivate patients here. Yeah? We have to, you know, um, show empathy. Um, we have to apply motivational interviewing skills and tell them, like, we give them hope and tell them that you can still live a healthy life by controlling your diabetes. A lot of times patients want to know whether they can be cured of diabetes, whether diabetes will go away. But we have to tell them the hard truth that, you know, um, it, it will not go away. It will stay, you know, you can still have a healthy life by controlling your diabetes, you know, by having the glucose under control. For long-standing diabetes patients, you know, they have had diabetes for about 20 years, for about, uh, you, know, uh, you know, 25 years. So what uh, we want to tell the patients is that we don't want to tell them that they are a failure. You know, um, a lot of times with the UKPDS data have shown that, you know, a lot of them are only left with 50% beta cell function at the beginning, you know, of their diagnosis. Yeah? So we can't tell them, you did not listen to me earlier. See, you ended up with insulin. So this is a very negative way of telling the patients. So instead, we can tell them that it's the nature of the diabetes itself that, you know, um, it'll be difficult to control their diabetes over time, even with an oral antidiabetic therapy. So we can tell something like, remember, I did tell you last time that you might need insulin one day. Okay, so let's talk about it. Yeah, that's, that's a better way to, 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 to discuss insulin therapy with them. So we have a lot of elderly patients who have adherence problem. We cannot expect elderly patients to just read uh, the labels. Yeah, they may have other problems like eyesight problems and, you know, 
um, you know, they, they may stay alone and all that without support. So we also uh, try not to prescribe complex medication, uh, complex anti-diabetic regimens to them, yeah, like multiple injections like basobolus therapy or, you know, uh, multiple medications, you know, more than they can actually handle. So we can tell them, uh, you know, re-educate them at uh, every regimen change. Yeah. Each time they see the physician, you know, every three or four months, uh, you know, more, more often than not, you have the regimen being modified. The insulin therapy particularly can have, the, ins uh, the doses can be adjusted, you know, reduced or increased. So it's very difficult for them to keep uh, up with that changes if it's not really, uh, you know, conveyed to them in a manner that they can remember. Yeah? So some of them also have, uh, you know, trouble organizing their daily medication. So we can help them by giving them pill box or pictorial charts. We can draw for them whichever ways that actually make them comfortable and, and actually improve their uh, you know, adherence. Yeah? And we try uh, to give them lesser pills, lesser, you know, to reduce the pill burden and try to give them lower insulin doses. You know, they may already have reducing renal function and uh, we do not want them to have hypo. So these are the things that we you know, need to discuss and, and actually offer them. And of course, uh, we know that elderly patients have the lesser, less tight A1C uh, goals, yeah? And we also need to uh, counsel their family members, right? So for insulin-treated patients, we do not force the patient to adhere to an insulin regimen that's not practical to them. For example, you know, a patient who is a taxi driver, you know, um, he may not have a fixed meal timing, yeah? So um, he doesn't have a fixed meal timing. He doesn't stop at one o'clock just for lunch. He might be just driving and taking a passenger. So you, we try not to give uh, him a very fixed regime like a, like a premix regimen, for example, yeah? Uh, you know, maybe a base of bolus will be better for him because he can delay the premial insulin, you know, he, whenever he feels like taking it or when he's ready to take it, yeah? Um, and also, uh, we can discuss about uh, the number of injections that are acceptable for the patient. We just don't tell the patients, I'm going to put you on uh, four injections or five injections. We need to discuss with the patient what they are actually uh, acceptable of. Yeah? And of course, a lot of times we, we need to address uh, this needle phobia, social phobia. You know, are you comfortable injecting you know, at workplace you know, if I give you a pre-lunch insulin? So these are the things that we need to discuss. Yeah? For working patients, uh, we should not actually ignore or downplay uh, their difficulties of adhering to treatment due to their own work nature, right? So they may be um, working in office environment which does not have, uh, you know, a pantry or privacy uh, to inject, you know, so they might not, they probably they are not actually willing to uh, share to their colleagues that they have diabetes. So they, they, they just probably, they are not comfortable of, of others knowing that they have diabetes. So, you know, we need to respect their privacy and sensitivities. We can tell them, you know, you can, you know, to me, sometimes what I will do is, of course, the most private place is the toilet. You can actually take a couple of minutes before you go for lunch and inject it there if you're comfortable. Um, so we need to talk with the patient and be their friend. Uh, you know, um, work out solutions that is acceptable to them, yeah? Uh, and a regimen that suits their work nature. Uh, if if they're very busy, they cannot take the, you know, uh, uh, you know, medications during lunch, then we try to actually give them BD dosing and all that, yeah? So retirees and homemakers from our, some of our studies, we found that actually they are very compliant, but sometimes they are actually doing things wrong, yeah? So they actually uh, can take extra, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, medications or actually, uh, uh, you know, what, what I meant is actually uh, these patients, sometimes homemakers or retirees, they wake up very early, okay? So uh, for example, they wake up at 5.30 in the morning, uh, but they have breakfast only at 8 o'clock. So they take their medications at 5.30 or 6, right? Because they've woken up, they drink water, they take their medications, and then they only take breakfast two hours later. So what happens is that they can be at risk of having hypo. We have seen a lot of hypos because of that. So we have to ed educate them, you know, to take medications just be I mean, to take the insulin or softening areas just before their breakfast. You know, we need to talk about portions. You know, sometimes they're at home, they're so comfortable eating, snacking, so the medications may not just work, yeah? Uh, it has its own limit. That dose is only uh, uh, able to match a certain amount of calories. So you need to actually uh, discuss that with your patient and also about physical activity. SMBG, we know that it's very important. SMBG, uh, checking glucose is very important to titrate uh, patient's insulin, but 
you know, as what Prof. Mafauzi have said, we also in Malaysia have to, you know, think about affordability. You know, you can't just prescribe a seven point daily uh, glucose testing to a patient who can't afford the glucose strips. So what you can do for me, uh, what I do is something is better than nothing. So I will ask them how many uh, a test that they're comfortable to do in a week. If they say about four, uh, then I will just uh, give them, uh, you know, one day uh, pre-breakfast, post-breakfast, then another three days later, a uh, pre-lunch and post-lunch, at least they, they check, yeah? Uh, uh, rather than not checking at all, yeah? So um, we, we need to handle patient's denial. Ms. Robbins have mentioned about denial, okay, especially in the initial stage when the patient is newly diagnosed, okay. We do not force adherence into a patient who is in denial state. We need to use motivational interviewing skills to listen for their reasons of unexpected, uh, unacceptance of their diabetes, you know, what do they think, you know. Um, you know, probably, uh, you know, we need to give a lot of hope. We need to tell the truth as what I mentioned before that, you know, diabetes can be controlled. Uh, they, will not, they may not just die of diabetes just on the day they're diagnosed unless they have DKA or HHS, but we can say that it is, you know, through the complications. So if you can control their glucose very well, then, you know, you, you can live like any other people, right? And, and sometimes you can't, uh, you know, not show some prominent personalities. I've actually uh, shown, uh, you know, the former British Prime Minister Theresa May with, uh, you know, glucose uh, monitoring. Uh, I think she used flash uh, 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 glucose monitoring. It was evident in, in, in one of the pictures where she was wearing that glucose monitoring chip on, on uh, her, you know, arm. And, uh, you know, just said that, see, you know, there are even celebrities who have diabetes and you are not the only one. You have to always empower patients. What sometimes uh, we have to tell our Malaysian patients is that, you know, we professionals are they not the only one who is responsible to, for their medication adherence and glycemic control. We must coach them to actually manage their own diabetes. This is what Ms. Robbins have mentioned. You know, must coach the patients not to skip their medications, to adjust the insulin dose on their own because we can't be with them for the next three months that they are not seeing us in the clinic to prevent side effects, you know, like hypoglycemia, you know, we use rule of 15 to effectively manage hypo so that, you know, they don't stop medications and also appreciate their self-achievements. Each time when they come, they have even a little bit of improvement in their SMBG. We have to appreciate them. That will empower them to improve their adherence, yeah? And, and, and lastly, I'd just like to show that we need to take side effects seriously. Even some mild side effects like GI, gastrointestinal side effects like diarrhea or bloating, that can be the reason why they stop those partic that particular medication, yeah? And, 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 and some serious side effects like hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia can be very terrible uh, to patients, uh, so it, it is best to actually avoid uh, uh, these side effects. You know, tell patients how to prevent them, provide solutions, and empower them how to manage uh, the side effect in case they uh, happen. Yeah, like hypoglycemia. So, in summary, I would like to tell you that medication adherence has direct effect on diabetes uh, patients' glycemic control. Medication non-adherence can be contributed by provider or system factors, medication-related factors, and also patient factors. Uh, a more personalized counseling approach may yield better adherence outcomes, and we diabetes care professionals need to respect patient sensitivities and work out medication regimens that are personalized and better suits our patients. With that, I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Navin. I'm going to just share my screen now. It looks like we've, um, okay, can you please unshare your screen? Thank you. Okay, it looks like we've come to the question and answer session. Um, uh, let me just try. Dr. Navin, do you mind unsharing your screen, please? And I'm going to, yes, share the question and answer um, slide. Let me just take a look at where it is. Now, um, while we are while we are organizing the um, questions, um, you might want to collect your CPD points. So, for doctors, you can actually um, scan the QR code that you see on on on, on your screen, yeah. And um, for pharmacies, you can collect your CPD points from the uh, from MPS and for nutritionists and dietitians from 
you can also collect your CPD points. Okay, let's take a look at the um, questions. I'm trying to get to the questions and I don't know how I'm supposed to do that. Just give me a moment. How do I do this? Okay, we've got 20 questions here. Um, I think we'll spend the next 10 minutes answering the questions. Uh, and if we have questions that we may not be able to answer today, we will answer it post-webinar uh, via email. Um, we'll address the first question that came in earliest at 2.55. It's for Prof. Mufauzi. Uh, the question goes like this. Even though some prescription may be out of reach for patients, especially in government hospital, uh, should we make the patient uh, know of these options? Uh Yes, I think that's a very good uh, question. Uh, so what I tend to do is that I will normally assess the patient's social economic status. Uh, and if the patient is uh, sort of able to purchase the drugs on their own, to self-purchase, um, uh, then I will inform them that there's, there is a, probably a drug which probably be better for you because you have this and this condition. For instance, a patient may have, say, a heart failure. And perhaps the, the best drug for this patient will be probably SGLT2 uh, on top of the other medications, perhaps, because studies have shown that it may reduce uh, hospitalization and even death. So I would probably suggest to them that, um, yes, they have uh, this particular drug, which may be better for you because you have this and this and this. But unfortunately, the hospital doesn't have it. So if you want to purchase it, then I can give a prescription for you, for you to purchase at the pharmacy. Yes, I think that's a very good uh, point because you have to make uh, this known to the patient uh, and especially if the patient can afford it. But if the patient, of course, uh, can't afford it, then possibly there's no point in discussion with them uh, because they probably will not be able to afford it anyway. So yes, good question. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Prof. Fauzi. Then we have a few more questions on medication, but this is, uh, I'm trying to group the questions together so that it makes for better flow. Um, and, and Ibrahim has a question. Uh, maybe this either Prof. Fauzi or Ms. Michelle Robbins or Dr. Nabi can answer. One of the issues with diabetes control is polypharmacy, you know, using too many medications. So how would you optimize the medications for patients with persistently uncontrolled diabetes? And, and, and trying to avoid polypharmacy if possible. Uh, yes, I'll probably answer that first. Uh, as for a medical practitioner, what we tend to do is that obviously patients with type 2 diabetes, they're not only on uh, oral anti-diabetic medication, uh, they're also on hypertensive agents and also anti-lipid agents and even anti platelet agent depending on their situation. So to try to reduce the number of tablets, one is we can probably do the fixed dose combination, i.e. two-in-one tablet or three-in-one type of tablet. That may reduce the number of uh, tablets that the patient needs to take. And possibly the other uh, way is actually to try to reduce the medication to a once daily type of medication rather than a twice daily type of medication. So uh, as a medical practitioner uh, in trying to reduce polypharmacy on our part, we tend to do that. Okay? But I suppose the pharmacies will probably have a better way of uh, uh, advising patients on how to take this medication so that they don't seem to be taking so much medication. Uh, Dr. Navin, do you want to add anything? Yeah, or? Um, yeah I totally agree with uh, Prof uh, because, uh, you know, um, we, we try to, I think the concept now is try to reduce complexity uh, in, in, you know, medication diabetes regimen. We can try to see if we can reduce the number of uh, medications or, you know, insulin. You, 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 we can, you know, of course, insulin can actually cover what, what the job that oral anti-diabetic medications can do. So in our clinic, if we can convince our patients, uh, uh, you know, to have insulin, then uh, we, we can actually reduce the number of pills. Yes. Sometimes, as what I mentioned just now, uh, we always have about eight to ten types of medication because they have hypertension, they also have dyslipidemia and they have diabetes and probably one or two other chronic diseases that pushes their medication numbers up. Yeah, So we can try to reduce the com complexities and that's where actually now we have lots of uh, pharmacological agents and uh, you know ways of um, you know, intensifying or de-intensifying uh, therapy as what Prof has mentioned. I think that's what we can do. 
Yeah. So the questions so far have been about the complexity of diabetes, you know, polypharmacy. And there's a question here that is also relatable. And I think this would be best answered by Ms. Michelle. It's about diabetes burnout. It's common among patients with diabetes. They may feel whatever they do, you know, you know, uh, they eat more, they eat less. Even if they follow their insulin injections, their sugar control goes what we call haywire here. It's just crazy. So how, how do we support this kind of patients? I think the most important thing is to actually acknowledge that it exists, um, that people aren't imagining it, uh, and this how common it is. So uh, burnout, diabetes, distress, uh, here in Australia, we actually have um, nationally produced uh, information around it. Um, and I think this is, again, where things like social media, peer support can become very um, uh, useful in that it, people with diabetes actually engage with other people with diabetes, being aware that they're, they're not the only one going through this. May I also say that there's actually burnout also for health professionals as well. Uh, and so I, you know, I think it's a concept that we as health professionals don't deal with very well. And I think it's very easy to blame the person with diabetes for not having a HbA1c of 7%. It's a complex condition, it's lifelong. And I think we need to be aware, and there are many tools that can actually identify diabetes distress, for example, and then it may be actually using people like a psychologist to actually really support people in that situation. Hmm. And uh, Ms. Michelle, there's also a question here on denial. How do, you, how do you manage a patient in denial? And I also see another question. Um, it's probably, um, I'm not sure whether it's denial of uh, that they need to use insulin or is it fear of needle injections? So, so patients move away. How, how would we manage such patients? How do we converse with them? I think, again, I mean, denial, I think, is is part of the whole uh, grief process of having a diagnosis of diabetes, the shock, denial, I think it's about acknowledging it and, and also the fact is that, you know, no one wants to have diabetes and it's then being able to support the person to say, actually, you know, uh, you do have diabetes. I know you don't want to have diabetes. Uh, let me talk about how we can make diabetes um, a far more positive thing so that it's not a really negative thing uh, all the time, that it's something that you control, it doesn't control you. The other thing around needle phobia, and again, it was well uh, um, talked about by Dr. Um, Naveen around fear of insulin, is uh, the fear of, of, of needles. And again, often the best thing to overcome a needle phobia is to actually uh, do a dry run of popping a four millimeter needle into someone's tummy and they're actually realizing that it's not painful, it doesn't hurt at all. And once you overcome that, and I would urge people to start looking at doing that once someone has reached maximum um, uh, oral agents and you're thinking that insulin might be needed in the next few months or couple of years. Once you demystify what insulin is and demystify injections, it actually is a fairly smooth process to move someone onto insulin. Okay. Um, we also have some questions. Uh, this will be back to medication um, because um, can we use SGLT2 as monotherapy? Uh, yes, in patients uh, who do not, for instance, tolerate metformin, I think generally metformin is still the number, the first choice agent. But you can use SGLT2 if a patient, for instance, uh, cannot tolerate metformin, or if the patient uh, have, uh, as I mentioned, the advantage of SGLT2 will be in patients who had heart failure, or patients who have established cardiovascular disease, or high risk cardiovascular disease and a patient with uh, uh, diabetic nephropathy. So you can use uh, SGLT2 in that type of patient, I think. Okay, uh, one more medication related question and it's about, uh, two, is it advisable to prescribe 2000 milligrams uh, extended release once daily in the morning to reduce frequency? Um, um, any, yeah. uh, uh, but, but as, um, as a practitioner, I think we tend to ask, uh, get patients to take the extended release metformin in the evening simply because it works mainly at the liver uh, to reduce uh, the fasting plasma glucose. 
So generally, I think the extended release is best taken uh, in the evening. Um, Dr. Nabil, you, uh, any, what's, your, what's your pharmacist uh, advice to your patient? Dr. Nabil? We seem to have lost connection. Yes, uh, I think, yeah, we seem to have lost the connection. Uh, right, uh, right. So generally, yes, the, the extended release. Back, no. Oh, okay, he's back. Yes. <laughs> Yes, I. Agree. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I agree with uh, Prof. Uh, Prof. Mofauzi. Uh, we just have to tell them why uh, they need to take it uh, in the evening, right? So you're talking about extended release, right, Prof? Yes, that's extended release. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Extended release performance, for example. So sometimes we need to uh, tell them the reason why uh, it works. You know, so you you want to actually suppress the gluconeogenesis, the liver production mm. of glucose. So you know, you you take it in the evening meals in the night when you're sleeping. What I'll tell is actually, uh, you know, you you are not eating. So where does the glucose come? The glucose comes from your liver. So a lot of our patients have misconception. You know that you know glucose only comes from their diet. So we also need to stress that the yes, liver produces right. glucose, mm. and this is best uh, tackled by metformin. In and that's the reason why you need so a lot of times in our adherence clinic when the patient understands the logic why they need to you know follow that advice then they, they tend to do it they, they need to understand why they need to otherwise they just probably take medication as like paracetamol <laughs> take it whenever they like it right yeah. so um yeah that that works okay the time now is 3 uh, uh 3 40 in the afternoon so we're slightly past uh, what we promised uh, and maybe we'll just take two last questions so there are a few questions here on self-monitoring of blood glucose i'll just come them together one is it important for patients with type 2 diabetes who are not on insulin therapy to practice smbg and if we have to encourage a patient to do smbg how do we do that and what about the frequency um, Ms. Michelle, uh, or Prof. Uh, Mofauzi, yeah. Uh, maybe Ms. Michelle first. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, certainly if someone's on a sulfonuria, they should be checking their blood glucose levels because they could still have hyperglycemia. So there's a safety issue around that. I think the problem is that self-blood glucose monitoring is often taught as a task rather than as a way of getting useful clinical information. So what we don't necessarily need is lots of testing. We need to do it in a strategic way. So initially, when someone has type 2 diabetes, I actually ask them to do two tests a day where they compare before breakfast and then two hours after breakfast on one day, before lunch and two hours after lunch on another, and before dinner and two hours after dinner on another, so that we're actually seeing what uh, blood glucose levels are like after someone eats, but we're also getting a, an idea of being able to uh, interpret the result knowing what the pre-meal reading is. So I think one of the issues is rather than teaching a task, we need to do things in a more strategic way so that people aren't just writing a number in that no one looks at on a diary, that we're actually uh, interpreting the results and then making useful clinical inform decisions around what those results are. Um, does Prof. Fauzi or Dr. Navin have anything else to add uh, to this? Yeah, I yeah, usually just my experience, uh, SMBG is very important. Uh, as I mentioned just now in the talk, I'd rather they do some readings rather than don't do it at all. I totally agree with uh, Ms. Michelle that, uh, you know, we need to be practical. We, we may not be, uh, uh, you know, able to actually ask them to test a lot for those who have affordability problems, not all patients, yeah? Uh, so what I do is actually I um, try to tell them what is the cost of those glucose strips. For example, you know, you just break it down to small numbers. You get one strip costs about probably two ringgit then I, I would ask them, how much are you willing to spend uh, for your glucose checking or for your diabetes in a week? Then, you know, I'll start with a figure, for example, 30 ringgit. Uh, is it too much for you? Okay, a lot. 20 ringgit or maybe 10 ringgit. Okay, then this keep quiet. Okay. So with 10 ringgit, you, uh, you can actually have about four or five strips. So, okay, with that, let's work on a schedule now. Okay, you, on Monday, you do pre-breakfast, first breakfast, and then another three days later on Thursday or Friday, you'll do another uh, pre-lunch or post-lunch. And then, you know, that's how actually you, you adjust based on the affordability. And then you can see that they, they do, and then they come back and show you. Uh, uh, some really have that uh, affordability issue. Uh, for those who can afford uh, that's an, another issue uh, is whether they're too busy or you know, whether, whether they, they don't want to do 
uh, that's also another issue. But um, uh, we have to sit down and uh, work out uh, a schedule that's actually comfortable for the patient. Right. Okay. And the final question here, I see there are a few questions here that um, have identified that the 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 art of uh, looking after a patient with diabetes is quite complex and um, how, how else can they improve their skills? How do they get better? Um, anyone? Hello. It's uh, practice. Just practice, I think. Um, and, and be prepared to l learn about diabetes from people with diabetes. Uh, I, I have an office full of textbooks and journals, but my greatest library is my patients. Uh, so we all learn from what works. We learn from what importantly doesn't work, but learn from people with diabetes. They're your best library. Yeah. yeah. Totally agree. Yeah. Um, okay. And as uh, the program director of uh, a postgraduate uh, diploma in diabetes management and education uh, degree, I think sometimes also we might maybe um, want to, further that and, and do a postgraduate certification in something or just do continuous professional development activities like this or continue discussing case studies. And I think that would also extend the, the knowledge yeah, and maybe the ex experience, the sharing of experience to help better care. Okay, so um, the timer is 3.45. Looks like we have actually answered most of the questions. There are some remaining questions left uh, and we'll answer the remaining questions post-webinar -web via email. So um, this live webinar has been brought to you by the Postgraduate Diploma in Diabetes Management and Education Program at IMU. If you wish to upskill as a diabetes educator, our next student intake is in March 2021. So thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar and we hope to see you again next time for some, a similar event. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, bye. -bye. Thank you. bye.